Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for being here. We all suffered a great loss on Saturday when Coach K. Yao passed away after a long battle with cancer. As much as we appreciated what she did on the court for 34 years here at North Carolina State University, we also had great admiration and appreciation for her courage and her grace off the court. Coach Yao was a great person, a great leader, and a great friend. She truly inspired us all. Here on K. Yao Court, let me ask that we observe a moment of silence to honor her life. Thank you. We will all remember K. Yao. Let me welcome you to North Carolina State's first Millennium Seminar of the spring semester. This particular seminar is being offered in partnership with the Harrelson Lecture. We are pleased to have with us in our audience today members of the North Carolina Congressional Delegation, Representative Bob Etheridge, Representative Brad Miller, and Representative David Price. Thank you for being here. Also joining us are several members of the North Carolina General Assembly, the University of North Carolina Board of Governors, current and former members of the North Carolina State University Board of Trustees, the Raleigh City Council, and of course our extended campus community. Again, thanks to each and every one of you for being here today. Millennium Seminars provide us with an opportunity to learn from the leadership and insights that come from our speakers' experience and their expertise. This morning, it is my distinct honor to introduce former President Bill Clinton. I am sure that everyone would agree that President Clinton has had an impressive career as a scholar and as a public servant. He graduated from Georgetown University and was awarded a Rhodes Scholarship to Oxford University. Upon returning to the United States, President Clinton attended Yale University where he received his law degree. He began his political career in 1976 when he was elected the Attorney General for the state of Arkansas. In 1978, President Clinton became the governor of Arkansas. And in 1992, he was elected President of the United States and served two terms. President Clinton's reelection in 1996 made him the first Democrat to win a second term as president in six decades. Under his leadership, the United States benefited from the strongest economy in a generation and the greatest economic expansion in United States history. After leaving the White House, President Clinton established the William J. Clinton Foundation with its mission to strengthen the capacity of Americans and people around the world to meet the challenges of global interdependence. The foundation fosters numerous initiatives focused on climate, international development, and sustainable growth. Using a business-oriented approach, these projects work to fight worldwide climate change and promote economic growth in developing countries. The foundation also seeks to find solutions to pressing issues in the United States, such as childhood obesity and economic development 
through success in small businesses. In addition to his foundation work, President Clinton joined with former President George H.W. Bush to help with relief and recovery following the 2005 tsunami in the Indian Ocean. President Clinton was named the United Nations Special Envoy for Tsunami Recovery, and he appointed his former Chief of Staff, our current University System President Erskine Bowles, to serve as UN Deputy Special Envoy. In this role, Erskine traveled and coordinated the relief efforts in Southeast Asia immediately following that immense disaster. And during the 2008 campaign, NC State was pleased to host visits, visits of the President's daughter, Chelsea, and his wife, Hillary, now United States Secretary of State. This morning, President Clinton will address the way forward, the course for America's future after the November 2008 election. His comments will provide insights on the impact of new presidential leadership on important national issues and policies. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming President Bill Clinton. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Chancellor, I am honored to be here. I thank you for hosting me, and I'd like to especially thank uh, Mary Easley, who invited me to give this speech and for whom I was honored to come. I understand we have uh, some members of Congress here, uh, Representatives Price, Miller, and Etheridge. And I know we have a lot of members of the North Carolina General Assembly I th and Council of State. I thank all of you for being here, and I thank you for coming out today to hear me. I, I have many uh, mixed feelings today standing on this very venue. First, I, I want to join the North Carolina State community in honoring and mourning the passing of Coach K. Yao. I'm a fanatic basketball fan. I admired her enormously. I lost my mother to breast cancer, and we should live every day the way she lived with her illness. I admired her very much. Uh, the second thing I'd like to say is, the last time I stood on this spot, it was not in a January. It was much later in the year. It was at a crowded political rally. I was running for president in 1992. It's the hottest I have ever been in my life. <laughs> and I was up there giving this speech. There's no air conditioning here. And I thought to myself, they're going to write my obituary and they're going to say, Bill Clinton talked to himself to death in an environment <laughs> where there was no air conditioning. So I always love coming back here. <laughs> uh, one of your distinguished uh, alumni, Governor, former Governor Jim Hunt, had me first come uh, more than 20 years ago. So I'm honored to be back at North Carolina State. The title of this leadership, I mean, of this speaker series is Innovation, Leadership, and Higher Education. What I'd like to ask all of you to think about particularly the students here, is the meaning of this moment, not just the inauguration of a new president and not just the financial crisis in which America and the world find itself, but in general, what kind of world are we living in 
and what are you supposed to do about it? And what, if anything, is your education supposed to contribute? And what does it mean to innovate in this environment? No state in America, I think you could compellingly argue, owes more to the power of higher education and innovation than North Carolina. For 40 years now, in this very area of your state, you have put higher education front and center, you have put economic and education partnerships front and center, and you have put the whole idea of innovation front and center. But all those words sound good. What do they actually mean now? What is the significance of this moment? How should you understand where you are? So let's begin with the paradoxes of the moment. It's hard to imagine a more hopeful time uh, and yet a more frustrating time. We just inaugurated America's first African-American president. There's a new sense of hope and possibility. Uh, Americans are looking good around the world again. He's got a great team. I particularly like that selection he made for Secretary of State. <laughs> and uh, I, I, uh, and we're feeling good. On the other hand, we're living through the biggest economic contraction this country has experienced since the Great Depression. With bad news every day, rippling out from America to the rest of the world, and a lot of uncertainty about what to do about it. And we have a new sense that America is going to improve its standing around the world and we'll have less unilateralism and we'll follow the rule of law and everybody will like us. On the other hand, when they think about closing Guantanamo, we learn now that a very high percentage of the people that were released having been detained as suspected terrorists turn out to have been terrorists and who have gone back, signed up, and actually put themselves in countries of operation in the hope of blowing up civilians. We have all this ambivalence. We want to be a force for peace. And so now we have to ask ourselves, how can we resume our role as a peacemaker in the Middle East at a time when both sides in the Arab-Israeli, I mean, in the Israeli-Palestinian matters seem to be less hopeful of peace than ever before? They want us to help make it. The world is full of paradoxes. What are we to make of all of it? First, let's start what I consider to be an, a good news story. What if we gave everyone in this room an essay exam, and we asked, write two pages on the true historical meaning of the inauguration of Barack Obama. And we gave you a clue. <laughs> we said, historically, there are two major elements of profound significance. I think 100% of you would get the first part right. That he's the first African-American president, and here we are in the South, living through and now being released from the burden of Southern history and the burden of slavery and discrimination and all the other stuff that went on and looking at a bipolar world and believing we only counted if we were divided. But I would argue that for the future of the young people in this audience, the second part of the essay question is more important. That is, it was possible to escape the burden of our history because this is no longer a biracial country anymore, and we don't see ourselves in that way. America is much more of a communitarian nation. We are multiracial, multiethnic, multireligious. We are more tolerant of people that have different lifestyles than we do. We know that somehow our futures are bound up together and we have to learn to get along. And that means that we haven't exactly moved to the left so much as we move forward together. And the typically used word is communitarianism. And 
What does that mean? That means that the fundamental fact of the 21st century is our interdependence. And interdependence can be good or bad. I mean, look at this Israeli operation in Gaza, right? It's a classic example of interdependence. When it started, nearly everybody in the world was sympathetic with it because Hamas had been hiding behind civilians to put rockets into Israel on Israeli civilians. And the Egyptian government supported it and took all the heat they took in the streets. The longer it went on, the more you saw the difficulties of interdependence. You conduct a military operation in a highly uh, densely populated area no matter how hard you try and how much advance warning you give, because the people you're trying to hit are hiding among others, innocent civilians will die. Then at some point during the course of an otherwise successful military operation, you have more people mad at you than are for you. So you have to figure out when to call it off and what have you won and what do you do afterward? Why? Because Divorce is not an option. That's all interdependence means. Divorce is not an option. They still share the same little piece of land. Their futures are bound up together for good or ill. That's what interdependence means. And it's the number one fact of life in the modern world. And it is the most important thing about the future significance of the election of President Obama, because it shows that Americans from right to left are becoming more communitarian. We're, we're, we understand that our futures are bound up together. We better figure out a way to get along together. And our differences make life a lot more interesting. Just glance around this crowd today. This crowd looks very different than it would have looked if some old gray-haired guy like me had come to give this speech 30 years ago, right? It's a different crowd. It's much more interesting. And we all know that our lives are made more interesting by our growing diversity, but we know that we can only make it a good, not a bad thing if we say our differences make life more interesting, but our common humanity matters more. So I would argue that the second part of your essay question should be we not only escaped the burden of Southern history, the burden of slavery in American history, we have become a truly 21st century, multiracial, multiethnic, multireligious country that has not necessarily moved to the left. We have moved forward together. We are more communitarian. We know now our future is bound up together. We have to go up or down together because we live in an interdependent world. And it is that second part of the essay question I would like to have you write that ought to inform how we think about all these challenges that are before us today, beginning with the economic crisis. Because the essence of leadership is first to know where you're going. Nearly all of us who grew up uh, in the South were raised on that old Bible verse where there is no vision of people perish. And nearly everybody who's like me ever lived in New York knows that Yogi Berra once said, I don't, I'm not sure where I'm going, but I'm making good time. You, you've got to have a vision. In an interdependent world where interdependence can be good or bad, it's pretty clear where we should be going. We should be trying to build up the positive forces of national, community, and global interdependence and diminish the negative ones. We should be trying to create a world where we share the future. We share the benefits and the opportunities. We share the burdens and the responsibilities. We don't hide our differences under the rug. We take them out and talk about them, but we do it knowing that in the end, we gotta find some way to come together or we can't go forward because unilateral progress in an interdependent world is in the end unsustainable. And I would argue to you that 
If that's the right vision, you want to create a world of shared benefits and opportunities, shared burdens and responsibilities, and a genuine sense of community, then it takes you to the next point. What are the major challenges of that world? Well, we're living with one of them today. This is a highly unstable situation. Look what happened. We built the, the interdependent economy took more people out of poverty in the last 20 years than had ever been lifted out of poverty in history. And then in five months, you saw $27 trillion in wealth disappear. That's twice America's annual GDP. And since we're given the year 22 to 24 percent of the world's income, that means the world lost almost half of its entire annual income in the economic adversities of the last five months. And it's a fragile interdependence. Yes, there are all kinds of problems and plenty to blame. You can say, well, people got home mortgages they shouldn't have. We shouldn't have had all these mortgages branched into securities, these subprime mortgages. The rating agencies failed. Uh, we should have all regulated hedge funds. You can say all that. Uh, but it's also true that we didn't have an interdependent response. Only a handful of public officials were asking a year and a half ago for America to respond to this housing crisis. If we'd done it a year ago, 90% of this never would have happened. If the decision had not been made in the flash of an eye to make an example of uh, the Wall Street firm Lehman Brothers, after having spent money saving everybody else, there wouldn't have been an interdependent trauma going through the market and maybe 40 to 50% of this stuff wouldn't have happened. But we are where we are, showing that what has been built up over 20 years can be crushed in a matter of months. So we have an unstable system economically. It is somewhat unstable politically because you see the largest democracy in the world, India, sharing the subcontinent with Pakistan. They're both nuclear powers. You have a terrorist assault in Mumbai, and you sit there and hold your breath that these two nuclear powers don't wind up fighting each other because of what happened. But what is the way out? This is highly unstable. We had 9-11 in America, but since then we've had terrorist attacks in Spain, in England, in Bali, in Indonesia, and lots of other places. So stateless actors who cannot easily be retaliated against can make this unstable system more unstable all over the world. So you have to ask yourself a simple question. How can we make this more stable? How can we minimize the chances that weapons of mass destruction will fall in the wrong hands? How can we minimize the chances that terrorism will rear its ugly head in far-flung places? One other example, our neighbors in Mexico are fighting an all-out war against big narco-trafficking syndicates who have so much money and so much firepower they can suborn the ordinary instruments of order and law, like local police, to set up a virtual independent empire, something we had previously seen done in Colombia, where as much as a third of the land has been in the control of the narco-traffickers and their terrorist supporters. It's an unstable interdependence out there. And we have a vested interest in what happens in their country. Our children do. So you have economic instability, you have security instability, you have organized crime and narco-trafficking instability. It is an unstable world. The second problem with this world is before the current economic crisis, we could see it was a markedly unequal world. And interdependence and sustained persistent inequality is a troublesome mix. In the world, half the world's people live on less than $2 a day. A billion people go to bed hungry every night, all before the economic crisis. 
For the last several years, one in four of all the deaths on Earth have come from AIDS, TB, malaria, and infections related to dirty water, cholera, dysentery, diarrhea. All these are diseases that don't claim many lives in America anymore. Few people die of AIDS in America every year now, either because they don't take their medicine or the, the way their body reacts to it just doesn't work anymore. But by and large, these are the diseases of the poor, and they claim one in four lives. 130 million children never darken a schoolhouse door. Tens of millions more around the world are nominally in school, but they have no facilities, no learning materials, no trained teachers. And yet in a poor country, every single year, this is hard for you to believe in a university, but every single year of schooling, including the first grade, if you get one year of schooling, it will on average in a poor country add 10% to the income you would otherwise learn every single year for life. This is a very unequal world and it makes political conflict more combustible. Still, all those Palestinians living in refugee camps that have been there for 40 years. The promises of a better life ring hollow to them. And if we could move those people out of the camps, it would make Israel more secure. And they're entitled to have a life free of terrorist fear. But inequality is a big problem. Inequality in income and opportunity, inequality in healthcare, inequality in education. It is persistent and it is pervasive in America. Starting in the 1970s, income inequality began to increase here. As we began to come out of the Great Depression into World War II and then all the way through the 1960s, America was growing and growing together. President Kennedy said famously in the early 60s that a rising tide lifts all boats. And we all believed it because it was true when I was your age. Starting in the 1970s, we began to have persistent inequality associated with the development of international finance and international economics, which brought otherwise enormous new opportunities for growth, but persistent inequality. For a long time in the South, and particularly in North Carolina, we thought we could fix it by giving everybody a better education because there were enormous income benefits to having first not dropping out of high school and second then going to college and, and finishing. There still are those benefits, but we still see growing inequality in America even among educated classes. The only time that we have had a reduction in inequality in America income inequality since the early 70s was in my second term because we were able to create so many new jobs, almost 23 million, that we created such a tight labor market across so many broad sectors of the economy that we had four years where we were growing together again. And the bottom 60% of the economy was actually growing in greater percentages than the top 10%, but it's a very rare thing because we have had growth dominated by finance and that tends to promote inequality. In this decade, before the recent financial crisis, 90% of the economic gains went to the top 10% of Americans. 1% of the Americans got 43% of those gains. The cost of basic things like healthcare and education increased far more than the rate of inflation and median wages increased less than inflation so that by the time this last election occurred, the median income for American families without regard to race was $2,000 lower than it was after inflation, lower than it was the day I left office while basic expenses were higher. So before the recent economic crisis, two thirds of the American people were already having a very tough time because we have not been able to find a politically viable way to address institutionalized inequality. Now, I think 
And let's talk, and the same thing is true in education, where there's a drastic difference in the quality of education available to Americans uh, that is related as much to income as to race and ethnicity. And it's true of health care. And I want to ask you all to think about this, remembering that we are interdependent. The president is going to have a chance to solve the part of the health care crisis that I tried so hard to solve that Americans have run away from while every other country has solved it, and that is how to provide quality health care to all Americans. He doesn't have any of the constraints that I had to face, including people in Congress denying that there was no health care crisis and uh, leaders in Congress insisting that I draft the bill instead of them. And frankly, we're spending like crazy, so there's no concern about the deficit for the next two or three years. And that's one of the good news is that we can do health care now because we have to grow the economy. We, that's good. That's a good thing. But, but I want you to think about it. The president's challenge is a totally different one, the one that I faced. The one that I faced was how to find a political way to thread a needle that had bedeviled America since the attempt to get universal health care almost destroyed President Truman's presidency. I think we'll get there. The problem today is how to do it in a way that doesn't destroy the long-term viability of the American economy. Because we're spending 16% of our income on health care and no other country with which we compete for the future spends more than 11. Yet they all cover everybody and get better health outcomes than we do. So what are we going to do? Cover everybody and spend 19%? Give our competitors an even bigger advantage? And can we agree in good conscience on ways to raise the quality and coverage of health care and bring our costs more in line with those of our competitors? It's really hard for the Congress to do under circumstances in which you know you don't have to worry about today's deficit. But getting this right is very important. So inequality is a big problem. You've got instability and inequality. The final problem we have with the modern world is its unsustainability because of climate change. And I presume I am by and large preaching to the saved here about this. Most people have recognized that we have, are putting an unsustainable amount of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and we have to find a way to do it differently. And uh, you know, I won't bore you with all the details, but I spend a lot of time on this. And uh, we just can't keep doing this, folks. I mean, even now, the Greenland ice cap is melting. That's 8% of all the world's fresh water on top of one island. If it goes into the North Atlantic, trust me, it'll have adverse consequences. Our 90% of the world's fishing stocks are under stock now, fishing centers. The more greenhouse gases go into the atmosphere, the more the oceans try manfully or womanfully, if you will, depends on what gender you think the oceans are, to take up the slack for the fact that we're putting too much carbon dioxide and too much methane in the air and tearing down too many trees to suck it up. The oceans are trying to take up the difference. What happens? We're changing the biological composition, the chemical composition of the oceans and their, the ocean's ability to sustain sea life. And keep in mind, fish are the most affordable source of protein for billions of people in the world is shrinking. And I could go on and on, but you get it. So if we really want our grandchildren to be sitting here listening to somebody else, Look at me and think what Barack Obama looked like in 30 years. You want him to come here and give a speech in 30 years? <laughs> Say, boy, that's a smart dude, and he still looks like he can play basketball. Right? If you want that, you better figure out how to grow an economy without putting more garbage into the atmosphere. If that's, and I think that's an important thing. 
So for all of you, if you want to build a world of positive interdependence and reduce the negative one, you must address instability, inequality, and unsustainability. And you might say, I did that. I sent an e internet contribution to Obama. Let me go back to my life. This is the last and most important point I wish to make. Because the world is interdependent in ways both positive and negative, we all know more than ever before and we can communicate with each other more. The internet is the most powerful tool of communication in human history. When I took office a bare 16 years ago, this country only had 50 sites, the world did, on the World Wide Web. 5-0. In the whole world. We had more than that now every second. Cell phones weighed five pounds. <laughs> this 16 years ago. The point I'm trying to make is things are happening too fast. Innovation is going on anyway. But it, in an interdependent world, it is no longer possible to, divide, to draw such easy dividing lines between what private citizens are supposed to do with their lives and what public officials are supposed to do with theirs. You say, don't bother me anymore. I voted, I gave money, I pay my taxes. Give me a break, what else do I have to do? The answer is a lot. Why? Because you can. Because you can. And I want you to think about this. For most of my life, when people ran for office or when they took office, all they talked about was what they were going to do and how much money they were going to spend on it. You agree with that? I mean, there's a big debate today. These things are relevant, by the way. Anytime somebody tells you some problem is not a money problem, they are never talking about their own problem. It matters what you do and how much you spend on it. But what is much more important today is the how. How do you go about taking the best of intentions and turning it into them into positive changes in other people's lives? The how. And I would argue that one of the best things that's happened in the interdependent world in the last decade is that more and more people are saying, I think I got a better how than anybody else. This is not just a, I'm going to build a, a better mousetrap. I think I can solve a social problem better than anybody else. There's been this explosion in non-governmental organizations. Biggest one in the world is the Gates Foundation. Bill Gates gives his money to that. Then Warren Buffett says, you do this better than I do. I'll give you my money too. But it's very interesting. There are a million non-governmental organizations in America, and half of them were started in this decade. Many of them around the technology of the internet. India has a half a million. China has about a half a million. All over the world, you see people like you are sitting in places like this saying, I'm sorry, I don't want to be a passive citizen anymore. I don't want to just listen to some politician show up, give a speech, take notes, and be able to recount what he or she said. I want to do. And in a world where the how has become the most important question, we need a lot of doers. How many of you really think you could get an A on the question of how you stop the deflation in housing prices and the general deflation of assets in America today? How many of us know how to deal with the fact that even though more and more people are staying alive who have AIDS in the world because of medicine, we still have two and a half times as many people being infected as we put on treatment every year? How many of you can figure out the how of continuing the fight against climate change even though the price of gasoline and coal have dropped in the wake of the economic recession? 
the point I'm trying to make is this. I don't think it's good enough anymore to define your citizenship by being a good, honest worker and a taxpayer and someone who votes. I think we all have to ask ourselves, what can we do as private citizens to advance the public interest, to build a more interdependent world? That's what you do here at North Carolina State. Every time you join any kind of group that is doing something. Look, I think advocacy groups are fine. It's fine to be in a political party and advocate. But we have a crisis of doing in the world today. We have all these problems out there that people know are problems that they can talk about till the cows come home, but nobody knows the how. How do you turn good intentions into real changes? That's what I spend my whole life doing now. Our foundation was able to figure out how to provide the most inexpensive, high-quality AIDS medicine in the world so that whatever amount of money the world was willing to devote to it, we could treat more people. Just on our contracts, a million and a half people are getting AIDS medicine around the world at a pittance of what it used to cost. We are trying to figure out the how of some interesting climate change questions. For example, how can we finance energy retrofits of every building on the campus of every college and university in North Carolina and not cost one red cent out of the ongoing revenues of the school at a time when you need all your money? There's a way to do it, and we figured out how to do it. How can we go to large-scale solar generation of power so we don't just have to worry about making silicon solar panels and photovoltaic panels and putting them on roofs. We're working on that. Can, is there a how to capture all the exhaust from all the coal-fired power plants in the world and can they actually be buried into the ground or interestingly enough, doing what's being done in Arizona, which could be done everywhere. In Arizona, they are capturing carbon by recreating Joseph Priestley's experiment of the 18th century, which revealed the relationship between plants producing carbon, uh, ingesting carbon dioxide produced by people when they breathe and producing oxygen so people can breathe it. They are putting huge, uh, long towers, if you will, glass enclosed towers of algae next to coal-fired power plants, and they take the carbon dioxide from the coal, they pump it into the algae farms, the carbon dioxide is ingested by the algae that then releases clean oxygen into the atmosphere, and you're creating a source of organic material that can be used to make biofuels or to generate electricity with. The how. Two interesting young Americans created an organization called Kiva.org. I urge you to all look at it if you don't know what it is when you leave me today. Kiva.org makes you a banker. Worried about your gang going broke? You can become one. It shows you entrepreneurs all over the world in the poorest countries. And you get to say, I like Lila in Afghanistan. And you can loan her anywhere from $25 to $100. Then you get regular reports on what's being done with your money, and you get paid back. And 98% plus of the people have been paid back. When you get paid back, you can either take your money back and go home or reloan it to someone else in a personally accountable system that goes all over the world. There's also a college professor in Kentucky, interestingly enough, who created a website that does the same thing for people with specific needs in America. So this kind of stuff is going on. You have to say, I've got to be a person involved in the how. I want my future to be good. I want my children and grandchildren to do well. We're trying to close every landfill in every big city in the world because we know, I don't know, how many of you have seen Slub Dog Millionaire? My favorite candidate for movie of the year. Okay, anyway. In the beginning of the movie, 
the kids are playing, these poor kids are playing in Mumbai, are playing ball on the airport runway. And the police come up and run them off because they got no business there and it's dangerous. And they start chasing them across the landfill of Mumbai. And it looks like they're walk, running across the Sahara Desert. It's so vast. You get over 20 million people, they can produce a lot of garbage in a hurry and just keep adding it and adding it and adding it. These things should be relics of the past. There should be no more traditional landfills anywhere in North Carolina, anywhere in the world. You should disaggregate the metal and send it to recycling and all the organic material, which produces methane gas, which is 23 times more powerful than carbon dioxide, can be gotten rid of by, you can compost it and turn it into organic fertilizer. You can turn it into biofuels or my personal favorite, you can compress it and make it a fuel that you can generate electricity with. And you free up all that land and all those public health problems. We're working in Lagos, Nigeria and Mumbai and Delhi and Mexico City, but you could work everywhere in North Carolina to make this be a job creator and a source of income and clean energy in an adverse economic time. My point is, there's always gonna be plenty to do. And so I leave you with this thought. The interdependent world is good and bad. It's been more good than bad or you wouldn't be here today. It's the most interesting time in human history to be alive. What we have to do is to make sure that the positive interesting things make it prosperous and peaceful and are not gobbled up by the negative ones. People have more information than ever before and more opinions, but there is still a shortage of people who can answer the question, how? How do you turn your good intentions into positive changes? So all of you should now, you want President Obama to succeed? Become part of a how generation. We need a how movement in America. People who can answer the question, how? Don't wait for someone else to do it. Figure out what you can do. And realize we are really all in this together. Divorce is not an option in an interdependent world, so we better make the best of each other and understand that as important as our differences are, our common humanity matters more. If we do that, it's going to be just fine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President, for those very thoughtful and provocative remarks. I just uh, whispered to the President that he was at a how-to university. And now we have a uh, special presentation. At this time, I'd like to ask Van Sana and Lolinda to join us at the podium for a special award. Van Sana is a senior at North Carolina State, double majoring in chemistry and art and design with a minor in religious studies. Good morning. President Clinton, on behalf of students at NC State, I would like to say thank you for coming to NC State. It's an honor to have you here. At this time, I would like to ask Mike Giancola, Director of the Center for Student Leadership, Ethics, and Public Service, and Ray Buchanan, President and Founder of Stop Hunger Now, to join me for a special presentation. <laughs> President Clinton, in honor of your leadership, and vision for a better world. NC State University and Stop Hunger Now are pleased to announce the creation 
of the President William Jefferson Clinton Hunger Leadership Award. This award will be presented annually to a college student from around the country who provides the strongest vision and leadership in the fight against hunger. The recipient will receive a cash award from Stop Hunger Now to further their involvement in the fight against hunger. Congratulations. At NC State, we have a long history of leadership in the fight against hunger. From research and food production, distribution, and food security, to taking lead on your University Million Meals event in which area universities come together and package a million meal in one day for school lunch program around the world. We are fortunate enough to have a strong partnership with our valley-based Stop Hunger Now and International Hunger Relief Agency. Stop Hunger Now's leadership in the fight against hunger continues to provide a, a strong vision on how we can end hunger in our lifetime. At this time, I would like to ask John Calkin, our first recipient of the Clinton Hunger Leadership Award, to come forward. John has provided a strong leadership in the fight against hunger. He has been very active in the Presbyterian campus ministry and has taken an active role in educating others about hunger and hunger-related causes. He has demonstrated a strong understanding of the causes of hunger and is currently completing his undergraduate research examining the public discourse surrounding the issue on growing human population. After graduating in May, he hopes to continue his studies of the causes of hunger and their relationship to political and religious discourse through graduate studies at the Harvard Divinity School or participation in the Emerson National Hunger Fellowship. Congratulations, John. Let me say just very briefly, thank you for clapping for them. I wanted to begin saying that Vansana Dolintha has uh, his own amazing record of public service, uh, both in North Carolina and all over the world. I want to thank him for setting an example and uh, for all you have done. And I want to thank and congratulate John Coggins. But I want to use this opportunity to give you an example of what you might do either to help him or to do something on your own in the same area. You, I already told you in my talk, I'll say it again, a billion people go to bed hungry every night. Okay, one of my foundation's <laughs> projects is making agricultural productivity a development issue again. The whole world began walking away from helping people in poor countries to become better farmers 30 years ago and almost nothing was done. Now we're all beginning to do it again. Want to do something to help people overcome hunger? Most people would tell you the politically important thing to do is to reduce American agricultural subsidies and European subsidies. I happen to agree with that. I would support that. But you'll do more in less time and feed more hungry people if you help people to distribute the food that is grown more efficiently in Africa, for example, and help more people to do what they could do on their own terms. Let's talk about America. There are 35 million people in America, believe it or not, who at various times during any month will be hungry. A lot of them are children. That's a lot of people. This current economic crisis has put an unconscionable burden on the food banks. I live in one of the most prosperous counties in the United States. Hillary and I live in Westchester County, and we got an emergency call from the church we attend. It's in a community next to ours saying that the local food bank had gone belly up. No more contributors, and people couldn't afford to send it food. They wanted our church to take it over. Would we help them? And so we did. This is a huge, huge problem. 
America is the only country in the world now, although you will see more, where poverty and the absence of good information and affordable alternatives have led us to greater childhood obesity and greater hunger at the same time, and the two things are related. He needs help. We all do. I'll leave you with one last thought. We're all talking about the president's economic uh, recovery program and all this money and what can be done to solve some of these problems. You need to know this. Today, only 65 percent of those people who are eligible for food stamps claim them. If you didn't do anything that helped him but to organize an effort here to make sure that every eligible person in the entire state of North Carolina understood there was nothing to be ashamed of, this is not a welfare program, and it's important to getting our economy going again, to have every child who's eligible for it get nutritious food and take that participation rate from 65 to 100, that's with money that's already there. The only point I'm saying is there are lots of answers to the how in this, and I am really honored that first you did this in my name, but more importantly, I'm honored that you first focused on hunger. Don't forget that number, 35 million Americans that every single month have a hunger issue. Many of them are children, and it's tied to the obesity issue. You could begin with things that don't cost a lot of money. Look at your local food bank and get people who are eligible for food stamps to realize it's not welfare. Help John. Don't just clap for him, help him. Thank you. John, uh, congratulations to you. And I think we just all witnessed a presidential challenge that we can all participate in at the same time. Mr. President, we want to thank you again for being with us today. We appreciate the legacy of leadership and public service that you personify. Let me close by thanking you, our audience, and in particular, a special thanks to our sponsors, who were Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina, Progress Energy, the Park Scholars Program, the Saffron Law Firm, and the North Carolina Farm Bureau. Thanks again to each and every one of you for being part of this Millennium Seminar. Very special. Take care.